good to see you this Wednesday night. I want to welcome you to Riverside Baptist Church. And it is good to have Pastor Nick Brown from Long Branch Baptist Church all the way up in Savannah, Missouri, uh, with us tonight. He'll be preaching. Uh, but before that, uh, we're going to show a quick video. Just our, our pastor sent an update video about the meeting out in Colorado. And so at this time, we're going to show that video before we begin the service. Good evening, Riverside family. Glad to see that you're in your place for the Wednesday night service, and I'll pray that God will bless you for being where you need to be tonight. Just wanted to give you a brief update on what's going on here in Colorado at Tritown Baptist Church. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, we had uh, wonderful services, a lot of brokenness, a lot of tears at the altar, which is things that only God can do, and I thank God for that. And then Monday night, we had a really good service. Uh, the altar was definitely used. And then one young lady was saved after the service. Uh, last night was, well, I'm not sure exactly how to describe last night, except that God met with us. God moved in. And I sure am glad he shows himself powerful like that. We're looking forward to the service here tonight. And I continue to tell the people that uh, you folks are praying for the service here. And I'm so thankful that I can tell them that. And I can know for sure that you are. That not only means a lot to me, but it has meant a lot to them that you would take time to pray for this meeting. I'm praying for you all back home. I have continued to do so. I'm very thankful for Brother Nick Brown, who is willing to stand in the gap uh, in my place while I am gone. I know that he has been praying and studying, and he'll have something for you there tonight. Please continue to pray for this meeting, uh, not only tonight, but then the men's meeting on Friday night and Saturday morning, and then Safe Travels Home. I'm looking forward to Sunday, looking forward to seeing everybody uh, once again. God bless all you folks. Uh, thank you for continuing to allow me and Miss Pam uh, be there for you. I thank, I'm very, very thankful uh, that uh, God has allowed me to be your pastor for this time. God bless you. Have a good service, and we look forward to seeing everybody on Sunday. Go ahead and stand, if you would, grab your hymnal there, turn over hymn number 489, hymn number 489, still sweeter every day. To Jesus every day I find my heart is closer drawn, he's fairer than the blue of the gold and purple dawn, he's all my fancy pictures in his fairest dreams and more, he'd say he grows still sweeter than Hymn number 264, if you would please. Hymn 264, Solid Rock. Hymn number 264. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Fails his love. 
Thank you. Be seated, please. Well, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you're saved? Hey, just a quick uh, announcement. Those of us that will be going to the Rock of Ages Prison Revival, end of the month, uh, I handed out some of these uh, uh, emergency data forms that you need to sign. I've got some of those back, but uh, if you didn't give it back to me yet, I need it back. If you could bring it Sunday, that'd be great. Uh, <clears throat> Track attack. Track attack. Who got to pass out some tracks? I've got some different looking ones here. Amen. Hold your hands up real high. Amen. So, uh, so I worked out at this auction lot. Just give you a quick testimony. Uh, down by Kansas City Airport, uh, J.J. Kane auction things. I think most of you know what I do there. But <clears throat> anyway, a lot of truck drivers come in there and they speak nothing but Spanish, Ukrainian, Russian. I mean, they don't speak anything else. And it's just barely figure out what they want to even do. Uh, so what is that? I guess people in America don't want to work, and so a lot of other people come here to work, and that's good for them, amen? So uh, I wrote Ron Jackson, actually texted him and said, I don't have any Ukrainian or Russian tracks, could you send me some? And he did, he sent me a pretty good chunk of each. So if you need some Ukrainian and Russian tracks, I have them. And actually this week, uh, I got to give out two uh, Ukrainian tracks, these truck drivers, and uh, one Russian guy. And so when I talk to them, I, want, I always try to make sure if they're Ukrainian or Russian, I don't want to give the wrong track. <laughs> I, you know, they're at war, so I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, they took the tracks and they just, oh, thank you, thank you, you know. You never know, amen? Uh, if you need tracks, we have tons of tracks here. And, uh, and I can fix you up with Spanish tracks, Ukrainian, Russian, amen? Anyway. Tonight's so many tip. <clears throat> My, how time flies. It does, doesn't it? Amen? Uh, we're almost the end of April. A third of this year is gone. Is that, that's just insane, isn't it? That's crazy. The older you get, the faster it goes. So, I remember when I was just a little boy, me and my brother Steve. I was five, he was four. We lived in the country. We had an outhouse for a bathroom. We had a well for drinking water. Wood stove for heat. Two bare light bulbs lit up the whole house. Yeah. Some of you are looking at it like, what? My first bicycle, age eight, Montgomery Ward's Hawthorne 26-inch model. My first job, putting up small bales of hay for my grandpa during the summer months from sunup to dark 30 for 25 cents an hour. That was 64 years ago. Uh, the first time a girl kissed me, she was a senior and the head cheerleader, uh, cheerleader for Lafayette High School. She worked as a car hop. I was a freshman, barely five foot high with shoes on, and a fry cook. We both worked at the a and Root Beer Drive-In on St. Joe Avenue. That's long gone. There's nothing there now but weeds, but anyway. <laughs> she kissed me on the cheek one night, told me I was a nice boy. I thought she really liked me until I saw the six-foot, two-inch quarterback for the Lafayette football team <laughs> pick her up one night after work. I knew I didn't stand a chance. <laughs> My first car was a 53 Buick Special, had a straight eight engine. I went out for football team at Savannah High School in the summer of 1966. I was so short that the team during practice would run over me like a herd of bulls running through a corn stalks. The coach had just one thing to say to me during practice. Wolfram, you will never make it playing football if you're always on the ground. Get up! <laughs> I graduated from high school, spring of 1970. That summer I was drafted to go to the Vietnam War, joined the U.S. Navy, ended up over there on an ammunition ship from 71 to 73, got out of the Navy, 
Went to a two-year college in Nebraska, learned how to be a tool and die maker, got a job. I was saved in 1976 in Cozad, Nebraska. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Moved back to St. Joe, joined this church in 1977. Was married in 1978 to Carol Ashworth. Wolfram now, but uh, been members here ever since. I'll soon be 73 years old. What happened, Brother Larry? We got old. The Bible says that a man's life is somewhere around three score and ten. That's 70 years. Anything more than that is just God being gracious. Amen. Uh, that means I'm almost out of time. If I'm going to see my loved ones saved, at least the ones that are still alive. My life, it seems like, has just flew by. My, how time flies. James 4.14, listen to this. Whereas you know not what should be on tomorrow... For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. My life is just a vapor. And you may think you have lots of time, but yours is running out of time too. <laughs> Amen. Those people that need to get saved around you, will you have this, will you wake up someday and think this? I thought I had more time. I thought I had more time. Hey, if we're going to get the lost around to save, we need to get at it. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. <clears throat> we are working on a couple of new track designs, too, and uh, some trifolds. So hopefully here in the next couple of weeks, Lord willing, those will be here, and we'll make sure we announce that when we get those in. Anybody not get a prayer sheet tonight as you came in? If you just raise your hand, we'll let the ushers uh, get you a copy of the prayer sheet. Did a pretty good job. Awesome. All right, on our prayer sheet tonight, obviously continue to pray for a preacher. He'll preach tonight, the revival meeting out there at Tritown Baptist Church in Frederick, Colorado. And then Friday night, they begin a men's conference, similar to how we do our recharge. It'll be Friday night and Saturday morning. Uh, so pray for that meeting. It's, uh, it's, it's been around for many, many years. I remember going to it when we lived out in Colorado. And so pray for not just tonight, but also for Friday and uh, Saturday morning as preacher uh, preaches, and then as he travels back Saturday afternoon. Uh, on our prayer sheet tonight, I want to highlight a couple of things. Obviously, continue to pray for America, uh, even as Brother Mike was saying that our years, uh, man, a quarter of the way uh, gone. We know what's coming up in November and the craziness of the election cycle. And so just pray for America, uh, pray for our government. Uh, under special request, I want to highlight a couple of things tonight. Jennifer Brown this is a family friend of the Marshalls. Uh, cancer has progressed, and she's down at MD Anderson for some testing. Uh, she's trying to get in to be seen tomorrow. So tonight, when we go to prayer, uh, if we could specifically pray that God would open the door uh, for Miss Jennifer to be able to be seen by some specialists down there at MD Anderson in Texas. Uh, about halfway down, Brother L.T. Milborn uh, got a piece of wood in his eye the other day at work. And so he's got an abrasion in his right eye. And so let's pray for Brother LT tonight. And then uh, just a few underneath Brother LT, Miss Olga Patterson. She's actually up at the Mayo Clinic. That's where the Stevens are tonight with her, uh, which is in Minnesota. Um, from what Brother Marty in the text message he sent me yesterday, um, they're going to have to do open heart surgery, was the last report that I heard. Um, and they're giving her about a 20 to 30 percent chance. And so they're supposed to be seeing some specialists and some other things in the next couple of days. So let's pray for Miss Olga. Uh, I know that they would appreciate that very, very much, as well as just a few underneath her, uh, Brother Marty. He's still awaiting his test results. So a lot going on with, with the Stevens family and, and, and uh, Miss Lisa's parents. I know that they'd appreciate we take the time to pray for him tonight. And then just if you want to write this one in, got this card tonight right as service started, Patsy Pauly. Uh, Patsy Pauly, that is Miss Lois Sherman's sister-in-law. Uh, she broke her foot and her ankle, and so if you would write that down, uh, Miss Patsy Pauly, and pray for her. And then at the very bottom of the page, upcoming events, uh, the ladies' retreat. So a week and a half from tonight, uh, next not this Friday, but next Friday night, the auditorium will be filled up. I think right now we're over 400. Are we over four? Where's Emily? We're over 400. How many? We're, I think we're over four. We're right at 400. We're somewhere right around 400. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, pray pray for all the preparation. A lot going on. Um, kids, if you notice, the gym's not open tonight. <laughs> yeah. 
because it's got walls and paint and all kinds of other stuff in there. Uh, but pray for all the preparation, and but specifically pray tonight um, for the ladies that are coming, the churches that are coming represented, as well as the speakers. So let's go ahead and take some time, go to the Lord in prayer, and pray for these prayer requests tonight before we move on with the service. Father, thank you again for the privilege it is to be in your house, and we're grateful for the opportunity we have to, uh, to come and to fellowship and to sing praises under your name and to hear the Word of God preached. Thank you for uh, Brother Nick being able to be here tonight, and Lord, I do pray that you'd use him, and Lord, the message that he's prepared, uh, I know that his desire is to be a blessing and encouragement to Riverside Baptist Church, so help us, Lord, as a church family, to be receptive to the Word of God, and maybe even now, Lord, asking you uh, to challenge us to search our heart, Lord, to see if there be any wicked way in us. Lord, help us tonight just to get things right with you on a personal level. And then we do want to lift up these prayer requests tonight. We do think of Miss Jennifer down there in Texas, Lord, at MD Anderson. I, Lord, I pray that doors would open tomorrow that um, only you could open and that some answers and, and maybe even a treatment plan could be taken care of. Uh, Lord, for Miss Olga there in Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic, I I do pray for the next couple of days for the, the test and the doctor's appointments, the exams, or just the possibility and the seriousness of this open heart surgery, and then the weight on the family as they're up there by her side. Um, Lord, even for Brother Marty, is while he's with his wife, watching his mother-in-law go through this and still waiting for his own test results concerning uh, his heart. Um, God just seems like so much that we could look at that... Uh, could just be overwhelming and maybe even discourage us. 
But the truth is tonight, uh, we know you're in control. And uh, we know that no matter what takes place, even as thinking about the message we heard Sunday night, no matter what storms we're in, uh, Lord, you're still in control and you still know what's taking place. And we just ask and pray that your will would be done in each and every prayer request that we've mentioned tonight, as well as those even that are on our prayer sheet. And then we do want to pray for the ladies' retreat uh, coming. Uh, we do pray for Miss Charity as she, be, as she prepares. And Lord, she's obviously praying about what to say, how to speak to the ladies during uh, that weekend, as well as for pastors, he prepares the message for that last service on Saturday. God, help us tonight not to just come in on a Wednesday night and go through the motions. Uh, Lord, help us to come in with a heart that desires to hear from you. And when you speak to us, Lord, help us to respond for your honor and your glory. We ask all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Brother Dan. Stand with me one more time, if you would please. Turn over to hymn number 396. Hymn number 396, I Must Tell Jesus, 396. I must tell Jesus all of my trials, I cannot bear these burdens alone, in my distress he blessing to have Pastor Nick Brown with us, pastor of Long Branch Baptist Church in Savannah. He's no stranger here, and Brother Nick is a blessing and encouragement, so after we take up our offering, Miss Anna sings, he's going to come preach, so make sure you have your Bible handy. Let's pray for the offering tonight. Father, thank you again for the privilege to be in your house. We do pray for this offering. Use it, multiply, and bless it for the preaching to follow. May you be honored and glorified. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. There were days I thought I'd never make it Out of the valley to the mountaintop 
But I wouldn't trade the lessons that I learned there. Cause in my deepest, darkest valley, I found God. He's there and His grace is sufficient. He's there and His promises bring peace. You'll find a refuge comfort friend unlike any other and how fellowship through sorrow is so sweet most of all you'll find he's everything he said he'd be circumstances cannot change his goodness Keep trusting in the unseen guiding hand. And when the journey seems to last forever, he'll carry you when you have no strength to stand. He's there and his grace is sufficient. He's there and his promises bring peace. everything he said he'd be there are two sides to every mountain another valley will come again oh but next time you know you'll make it and the lord will see you through the end he's there and his grace is sufficient Praise the Lord. It is good to be back here at Riverside Baptist Church. I do want to thank you for being faithful to the Lord's house tonight. I know that's an encouragement to your preacher. And it's, uh, it's good to see that everybody survived the uh, solar apocalypse thing that we had going. I mean, solar eclipse thing that we had going. Is it on? Oh, here we go. Here we go. We're good. Green means go, right? Yellow, yellow I, tell my, I tell my sons this. They say, what does a yellow light mean at the stoplight? I said it means go faster. Yellow. Uh, and then my wife says, no, that means slow down, but that's, that's us men go faster. Uh, but it is good to be here tonight, and I do want to thank you for being faithful. I know this has been a uh, crazy week with the solar eclipse and different things going on, but uh, I see the rapture hasn't happened because the church is still here, praise the Lord. So, uh, but we're still looking. You know, as Christians, we're not, we're not looking for signs. We're listening for the trumpet. We're listening. We're listening. And uh, we're watching upward, not around. We're watching upward, not around. Um, but it is good to be in the Lord's house. Why don't we open up to the book of Colossians tonight? Book of Colossians, chapter number 3 is where we're going to be. We're going to use some scripture tonight. Uh, we'll also be in Romans chapter 6 here in a little while. Let's see here. Colossians chapter number 3. I'm going to read through this chapter here. We're going to read through uh, chapter number 3 of Colossians tonight. Just to give us some context of what we're going to be talking about. In Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 1, it says this. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. That's exactly what we were just talking about, looking upward, not around. He says in verse 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Praise God, that's the day we're looking for right there. Verse 5 says this, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, 
and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, and the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all things, uh, all these, excuse me, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Wherefore there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, uh, nor uncircumcision barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Tonight we're going to speak on the topic or the idea of going from daily duty to divine delight. Going from daily duty to divine delight. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help with this message tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for allowing us to meet in your house again tonight. Lord, I thank you for Riverside Baptist Church. I thank you for them being faithful. I pray that you will be uh, with the preaching of your word tonight. Lord, I pray that we'll set aside distractions. We'll We'll, we'll pay attention on purpose tonight. And Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'll uh, do what I cannot do. I pray that you will speak to hearts tonight. And Lord, that we'll come to a place of, uh, of, of decision. Lord, a, a place of choice where we desire to follow you with everything that we have. And Lord, you're worthy. And we just want to say tonight that you are worthy of everything that we can do uh, in, the spirit of, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just pray that you'll bless this time. Be with Brother Marshall as he's away. I pray that you'll, Lord, be with him in his meeting as well. And I just pray that you'll be with him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing tonight. There's also a, another verse that goes hand in hand with uh, uh, verse number 17 of our text here. Verse 17 says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the, and the Father by him. 1 Corinthians 10.31 also says, Whether for, Therefore you eat or you drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now when it comes to the book of Colossians here, we have Paul uh, the writer of the book of Colossians, he's writing to this Colossian church here, and uh, he's writing this letter not as a letter of correction. There's many, there's many letters that uh, were written that were letters of correction, uh, but I believe that this letter was written to the Colossian church here as a letter of exhortation, but also a letter of warning. A letter of warning. Go back to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 1 with me, if you would. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and grace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. For we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. There's the key right there. The key word of chapter 1 is the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. God's desire is for the gospel to go forth. God's same desire for uh, that time and that day was for the gospel to go forth. His desire for 2024 is for the gospel to continue to go forth. Why? Because the gospel is what has the power to save people, and the gospel is what has the power to change people. We're talking about America, 
And I don't believe that God favors one country over another. I believe the Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He loves all nations, and He desires for all people to come to know Him as Savior. But the gospel is the key ingredient because the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the same message for that time is the same message for the day. It's about getting the gospel out. Now, the gospel is a message to the whosoevers. I'm thankful for a whosoever gospel. I'm thankful that the gospel is not a gospel of, of uh, you got to be a certain elect, or you got to be a certain nation, you got to be a certain type of person. I'm, I'm thankful that if you were born on this side of the tracks or this side of the tracks, God can save you if you come to Him. I'm thankful if you were born in poverty or you were born in riches, God will save you if you'll come to Him by faith. I'm thankful that if your, your skin is a certain color or you're a certain nation, nation, nationality, it does not matter. God so loved the world. There's an attack on the gospel today. There always has been. All, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these letters that were written, Paul wrote back to these, these churches to warn them that as they went forth with the gospel, as they were changed and they took forth the gospel out to uh, the, the ones that had not believed yet, that there was going to come attack, an attack on the gospel. But the gospel is very simple. The gospel is, says that we've all sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's everybody. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says that there's a penalty for that sin. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 and I'm thankful that God didn't stop there. God didn't just tell us that we're condemned and that we're good for nothing and that, 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 that we, we have to spend an eternity in the lake of fire, eternity in hell. I'm thankful that He's a God of mercy and He's a God of grace. And He reaches His hand down. And as we reach our hand up to Him, He pulls us up where we need to be. He reaches down into that miry clay. He, he gets us out of that dirt. He gets us out of that filth. And He can set our feet, up, our feet upon the rock, the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can make all the difference. I'm thankful for God that loves sinners. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I'm thankful for the promise that all can be saved by faith in Jesus Christ if we'll come to Him. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession, confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That promise was good then, and that promise is good today. You say, what, why are we here? That right there, the gospel. That's why God has kept us here. God has a purpose for us. God has a, a, a mission for us, and that's to take the gospel to our city. I'm thankful also for Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. There's a change that takes place. God before ordained, and he, he had a purpose for us, and He has a, 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 a mission for us, and that's for us to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. But a message of the gospel is not just a message to the whosoevers, because if we're not careful, we'll get caught up in that. We'll get caught up in the salvation aspect of the gospel, the gospel also is a message of the whatsoevers as well. See, becoming a Christian changes our position. When we get saved, we're saved, we're sanctified, we're satisfied, we're justified, we're washed, the Bible tells us. But it doesn't just change our position, it should change our practice as well. That's our daily walk, that's our devotion to God, that's our faithfulness to the Lord. See, the gospel saves the believer, but the gospel also changes the believer. Chapters 1 and 2 of Colossians, the Apostle Paul is exhorting them to continue in those things that they had learned after they had received the gospel. No, when someone gets saved, I don't think someone that gets saved understands everything that they should understand. They have to realize they're a sinner and that their, their sin deserves hell and that they need a Savior and they have, have to by faith repent and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that's what takes place when salvation takes place. But there's so much to the Christian life than just going to heaven and being saved. Now, I'm thankful that we have a home in heaven. But chapter 3, he goes into the responsibility of a born-again Christian, what our responsibility is. 
There's some things he said, go back to chapter 3, verse number five, uh, chapter 3, verse 5 in Colossians. There's some things after he speaks about seeking those things which are above and uh, setting your affection on things above, verses 1 and 2. He said, you're dead with Christ in verse 3, and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appeal with him in glory. Uh, he went from beginning to the end there, but then he's going to talk about the middle part, which is the part in our life we're at right now if you're saved. You know, you've been saved, and you're waiting for that glorified body. You're waiting for that day you're going to be with your Savior. But there's a, there's a long span in, that, in between that that takes place. That's our everyday Christian life. He says in verse 5, mortify. That word mortify means to, 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 to nail to something, to, to put to death. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon, uh, upon the earth. And he goes through fornication and cleanness and ordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. He speaks of things that ought not be a part of a believer's life. He goes on in verse number 8. Let's get down with me if you would. He not only talks about mortifying some things, but also putting off some things. Those are conscious efforts every day to put off these things, making a decision. He says in verse 8, But now uh, ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. He's saying there's still a war inside of you. You still have a, you have a spirit nature because you got saved. You've got the Holy Spirit of God, but you now still have the flesh nature that you have to deal with day in and day out. And the one that has victory is the one you either put off or you put on. Verse number 10, he says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor un uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is in all, is all, and is in all, uh, in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Uh, perfectness. He says that takes work. Doesn't come natural to, for us to put on uh, humbleness of mind. You know why? Because it goes against our nature to be humble. Our natural nature is pride. That's what we naturally are as humans, is prideful. Uh, he, meekness and kindness. For being, it's not natural for us to want to forgive one another. That's not what comes natural, but he says that we must make a conscious choice to do these things. What is that? That's a responsibility that Jesus and that, that, that Paul is writing to this uh, Colossian church here. He's telling them this is the duty of a Christian. You see, when we get saved by the power of the gospel, it makes us citizens in heaven and adds earthly responsibility to us. There's a false pseudo uh, Christianity today that is a, a, a Christianity of uh, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I'm good, I can do whatever I feel, good, feel like doing, whatever feels good, whatever, you know, we're under grace, we're not under the law today, so, you know, if it feels good, do it. That's a false Christianity today. Because we are saved, there's great responsibility that comes with that. There's a saying that says, with great power comes great responsibility. And it's very true for the, the believer. God has entrusted so much in us uh, not because we're something special, but because He loves us and He still uses the medium of humans to get forth and proclaim the gospel, to have the gospel to go forth. We have spiritual responsibilities to fulfill on this earth. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 says this, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He's saying there's coming a judgment seat of Christ for believers. There's coming a day where we're going to be, we're going to be tried and we're going to be judged on the things that we've done. And uh, he says some as that, the, 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 those, those actions and those, those works that we've done, uh, this is after salvation, of course, because we, of course, know you can't be saved by works. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But there is, after salvation, a time in a Christian's life where there should be good works. Ephesians 10, uh, 2 10 says that, that we're saved unto good works. And there's going to come a day, I think, if we would have in our minds day in and day out, that there is coming a day where we're going to appear before uh, the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the righteous judge, and we're going to have to give an account for everything that we've done in this body, whether it's been good or whether it's been evil. I think it would change our perspective a little bit. 
Titus 2 also says this, 2.11, verse 14, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that grace that God that, that has appeared to us teaches us some things, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. See, in this life that God has kept us in, there are a few things we ought to be doing. We ought to be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ day in and day out. Not just when we come corporately to church, but even in our homes and even in our personal lives, there should be an attitude and a lifestyle of worship day in and day out. We also ought to be working for the Master. We ought to be working, not just worshiping, but working. Worshiping always requires sacrifice. And working is going to require sacrifice on our part. But we also ought to be watching. That's what that verse said there. Watching, watching for His appearing, not for things around us, not for signs. We shouldn't be looking for the Antichrist. We shouldn't be looking for those things. We should look, be looking for the Lord Jesus Christ and His return. There's some things in this chapter I want to kind of go through tonight that the Lord spoke to me about, and I hope this will be an encouragement to you. Look back at Colossians chapter 3. We're talking about going from... from daily duty, and it is, our, it is our duty as Christians to, to serve the Lord, but oftentimes we can get caught up in the fact that it is a duty, when in reality, in our Christian life, it should always be a delight. First thing I want us to look at tonight, we're talking about the whosoever of the gospel. I want us to first look at the master of whatsoever we do. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse number 17. It says, and what sort of you do in word or deed? That, that's everything. That's everything we say, everything we do is what it's saying there. Word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the fa uh, to God and the Father by Him. First, we're going to look at the master of whatsoever we do. The master is a man who rules, governs, or directs either men or business. It could be a lord, it could be a ruler, or one who has supreme dominion. There's many different definitions for the word master all through the, all through the Bible. But I'm afraid that there are some times in our Christian life where we can become to get uh, we can we can get to the point where we become dissatisfied or even unhappy in our Christian walk or in our Christian life. I believe there's a few things that can cause this. Uh, the first thing is obviously sin that can come in and can and can cause uh, can cause those types of feelings and cause that type, our walk to not be what it should be, doing things that displease the Lord. But oftentimes we can come to the place where we keep back part of our lives for ourselves from the Lord. We say, Lord, I'm going to give you 99% of my life, but that 1%, I want to keep that to myself. God desires that we give Him everything that we have. He's worthy of it. I mean, to love the Lord God is giving our whole life, our whole self, our whole being to Him. And if we love something, we're going to give ourselves to it. If we love someone, we're going to give my, ourselves to them. I'd be like me, me marrying my wife and saying, well, honey, I'm just going to give you 90% of me. 10% is for this person or is for me to keep. You know, the Bible says we should love Him because He first loved us. And if we love the Lord God and we love Jesus Christ and we love Him the way we say we love Him, it ought not be a, a drudgery or something that, that, that seems harmful to us to give our life and give ourselves completely to Him. Oftentimes, we can fail to realize who should be supreme in our life. And let's remember too, when we got saved, when we got saved, we signed all rights over to Him. Because He's our Master. You know, there was a time in your life, and there's a time in my life, if you're saved tonight, you served another Master. And I, I tell you what, I don't like going back thinking about that other Master that I used to serve. You say, what is that? Look, hold your place here. Look over at Romans chapter 6. Look back at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter number 6. We're going to read a little bit of Scripture here. Bear with me. Verse number 3 is where we're going to start. We're going to read down through the chapter. It says this, Know you not that so many of us as are baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are, baptized, or excuse me, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so 
we also should walk in newness of life. See that salvation right there is talking about. We were dead to, we're dead to sin, now we're alive in Christ. It's a picture of baptism. That, baptism, when someone gets baptized, it's the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and how we are buried with him in death, okay? It's a picture. Uh, verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of, de- of his death, we, also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he live, liveth, he lived unto God. He liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are, no, uh, we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You see the exchange there that took place? Free from sin. We were servants of sin. Now we're servants of righteousness. Let's keep reading. Verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are not ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Here's the key. But now being made free from sin and became servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God for the difference He can make when He saves a soul. Uh, The Bible says that we were buried in the likeness of His death and were raised in newness of life. When we get saved, we don't have to serve that old master. We don't have to serve sin like we did before. We now have a new master, and His name is Jesus Christ. See, before I got saved, I was a servant of sin. Sin was my master. But after I got saved, and after you got saved, we now have a new master. Praise God, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the first step in following Him, that's the theme of Riverside Baptist Church for this year, is to realize that He is in charge and that He should be in control of our lives. Nothing, nothing should be off limits to the Master when He's dealing with us. And the thing is, is even with slaves or servants in those days, uh, the Masters almost always knew what was going on. They knew what the servants were doing. They knew where they were at. They knew what uh, tasks they were performing. And the same thing's still true for us. God knows what we're doing. God knows where we're at. We don't belong to ourselves. Nothing should be off limits to the Master. Why? Because we belong to Him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. See, this only works, uh, the the submission to the master and the yielding to the master only works when we realize that the master uh, is in control, and then we realize the master-to-servant relationship. Paul, when he referenced himself throughout Scripture, he oftentimes, and almost in most of the books that he he wrote and wrote his name, he said, a servant of Jesus Christ. Peter, in 2 Peter, he referenced it as Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ. Jude, when he wrote the book of Jude, said the servant of Jesus Christ. James, when he wrote the book of James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus even said in Mark chapter number 10, he said, But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you, of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. See, Jesus, I, he, he, he came and he said, I'm giving you the example and that, uh, that, that as He came to do the will of the Father, we ought to do the will of the Master in our life. 
You say, why are so many Christians maybe out of order or out of control today? Because they have failed to truly come to the realization that Jesus is the master. And when we realize Jesus is the master, there's nothing that we won't do for him. There's no door we won't knock. There's no track we won't give out. There's no sacrifice we won't be willing to make. There's no changes that we won't be willing to make in our homes that God leads us to make. See, when we realize He is the Master, it changes everything. See, Christ should be the Master of all that we do. And Jesus even said this in Matthew chapter number 6. He said, no man can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. He said, you cannot serve God and mammon. He said, you can't have two masters. You're either going to submit yourself to my authority, God's authority, and you're going to serve me, or you're going to serve self or serve, serve the devil. Hudson Taylor, famous missionary, said this, if Christ is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all in our life. That's, that's God's desire for our lives, is for him to be Lord of all. Lord of all. So first we see the master of whatsoever we do. Go back to Colossians chapter 3. It said there in verse 17, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our master. Secondly, skip down to verse number 22. Now in between 17, chapter, or verse 17 and 22, you've got all relationships, that well, pretty much relationships you're going to deal with. You've got family relationships, husband and wife relationships, children relationships, uh, uh, father relationships, you've got the, the, the work-life relationships, you've got all these different uh, church relationships, you've got all the different relationships it talks about there. But then verse number uh, 23, it says this, excuse me, verse number 22, it says this, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Here's the key. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So not only do we see the master of whatsoever do in, in verse 17, but we also see the motive of whatsoever we do in verse number 22. Ephesians 6, 5 and 6 says it like this. Uh, it almost parallels this verse. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of, the, uh, the will of God from the heart, with the good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. We're talking about the motive of whatsoever we do. Motive means that which incites to action, that which determines the choice or moves the will. Uh, and, uh, another definition, I like simpler definition, definitions. They help me. It's reasoning behind a decision. Reasoning behind a decision. See, our motive should be, in our Christian life, our motive should always be to live for the glory of the Lord and not the gain of men. To live for the gain of men is eye service. You look at that word eye service, it's sight labor. It's doing service because others are watching. And remember, he even, he even spoke to the Pharisees. I believe it was Matthew chapter number, 10, uh, number 6 where they, they, they did their long prayers. He said, don't, don't pray in public. Go into your closet and pray because if you pray in public before, uh, before the men or you do things in, in public before, before men for their approval, you'll have your reward. But he said, if you'll go into your prayer closet and pray in your prayer closet, you'll have your reward of the Lord in that day. That's motive is what that is. Our motive. This has to do with why we do what we do. I had a story of an elderly man. This elderly man, this elderly man was on the beach one day, and he, he came across a magic lamp. He picked it up, and poof, out popped a genie. A genie appeared. And the genie said, Because you had freed me, I will grant you a wish. The man thought for a moment, thought for a little while, and then he responded, he said, my brother and I had a fight about 30 years ago, and he hasn't spoken to me since. I don't know if that sounds familiar to anybody, but that uh, sounds like some things that would happen with family sometimes. He says, I wish, that he, I wish that he'll finally forgive me. That was the wish he made, that his brother would forgive him. There was a thunderclap, and the, the genie declared, he said, your wish has been granted. He said, the genie went on to say, he said, you know, most men would have asked for wealth or fame, but, but not you. He said, but you only wanted the love of your brother. He said, is it because you're old and dying? The man said, no way. 
He said, but my brother is, and he's worth about $100 million. You see, money was his motive. He didn't care about his relationship with his brother. He was after the money. And he was going to do whatever he could to get to the money. The question we have to ask ourselves is, why do we do what we do? Why do you do what you do? Do you do it because it's expected? Do I do what I do because it's expected? Maybe it's expected from your pastor. Maybe it's expected from your family. Young people, maybe it's expected from your parents. Maybe we even do it because it's expected of us from God. Or do we do it because we genuinely love the Lord Jesus Christ and we desire to give our all to Him and glory to Him and we'll know one day that our reward will be in heaven if we have the right motive. Because we've got to remember, we teach this to our children, we teach this to our young people, but how often can we forget it, that God sees it all. The Bible says that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. God sees us. He doesn't just see us on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and special revival meetings, special retreats. He doesn't just see us on those days that we get ready for church. He sees us day in. He sees us day out. He sees our desires. He sees why we do what we do. I'll tell you this, a proper love and a proper fear of God will make your motives right and will allow you to think right and to live right. But not only to do what's right, but to do it with the right spirit for the right reasons and with the right motive. Love will change our motivation and change our motives. So we see there in verse number 22, it said, Not with eye services, men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. We see the motive of whatsoever we do. Lastly tonight, look at verse number 23. We've seen the master of whatsoever we do, that Jesus is our master. We see the motive, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. But lastly, we see the manner of whatsoever we do. Verse number 23 says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. To do it heartily to the Lord and not unto men. Heartily means to give it your all, to put your whole heart into it, your whole being into it. The manner of which you do it. Manner means a form or a method or a way of performing or executing a custom or a habitual practice. I thought of professional athletes or Olympic athletes or whichever type of sport you'd like to put in there. I think of baseball players and how they have that, one. I think it's 162-game season a year. They have a long season. Uh, but they have off time. Even football players, they have off seasons. And off seasons, they have to continue to train. They have to continue to put their heart into their craft so that they can perform at their best. And as Christians, we have to remember that it's not us performing. It's not a performance. It's allowing the Holy Spirit of God to live and work through us. Because if it becomes about a performance, it becomes about uh, that, uh, so like making a spectacle then it's all in vain. There also should be no division of the sacred life and sacred part of our life, the church life, and the secular life, that's our home life, our work life, our public life. There should be no division. The Bible tells us that we are to be full-time Christians, whether we're in the church stores, we're at our, our, our own home, where we're at but also that we need to do everything enthusiastically in this Christian life. It doesn't mean that we don't go through trials, we don't go through sorrow, we don't go through valleys, we don't sometimes get into maybe a rut, get into some depression. You know, those are natural things. Even, even the men of God in the Old Testament dealt with those things. But we, when we realize who we're serving and just what He has done for us, it'll help us to do things enthusiastically as He wants us to do them. Let me encourage you, don't lag in your assignments from the Lord, but lunge into every task. Don't drag, but dive into every responsibility. Don't groan, but give full devotion to every job that God assigns you. I want you to ask yourself this question, what will my life be for those who are watching me? 
Because we're not called to be men pleasers and to do things with eye service, but I will tell you this, there's always people watching us. There's teenagers watching the adults. There's kids watching the teenagers. There's adults watching the teenagers and adults watching the kids. We're always, I don't want to say this to be, sound creepy or anything, but we're always being watched. I oftentimes have heard that, I've heard preachers say, you know, uh, my, my family lives in a glass house. And I agree with that. But I think as Christians, we live in a glass house. And the thing is, we've got to remember that people, people are watching. They're watching our, not only just our moves, but they're watching our motives. And they're watching if we're serving the Lord or not. I want us to ask our question, ourselves this question tonight. Will every word and action bring glory to God? Or could some of those things bring shame to the name of Christ? Will my conduct bring others to Christ? And how, how I'm living my life, if someone was to judge me based off of how I'm living my life, would they desire to be a Christian today? I think there are some things that you can do to find real joy in living, the manner of whatsoever we're doing. We should do our work heartily as unto the Lord whether it's our career that we're in or, or spiritual work or housework or whatever we're doing, whether you're washing dishes or whether you're taking the trash out. Young people, hopefully you take the trash out for your parents. Whatever we're doing, we should do it heartily as unto the Lord. But we should be willing to work for our Father that's in heaven and work harder for Him than we even would for our employer. We should be willing to work for Christ and not just for the company. And I want us to remember tonight that we don't just have to serve Christ because we're saved. No, we've got it all wrong if that's our mentality. We get to serve Christ if we're saved. Verse 24 in this chapter is the key. Look at verse 24. It says this, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. I think oftentimes we've got to give ourselves a reminder of who we serve and that, yes, we're members of the church, we, we, we're doing it to win people, we're doing it to serve one another, even serve our pastor, your pastor, but ultimately it comes back down to we are serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's a poem that goes like this by C.T. Studd. You, you may have heard it. It's called Only One Life. He says this, two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life which will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one, soon will its fleeting hours be done, that in that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life which will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to heave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life which will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its days I must fulfill, living for self or in His will. Only one life which will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world should trumpet me sore, when Christ would a victor, victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life which will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep, in joy or sorrow thy word to keep, faithful and true whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life which will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one, now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. So in conclusion tonight, the, 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 the life of the Christian should be the best life. The life of the Christian should be the best life. Because it should truly be divine. 
It should be a delight to live for your God. Making Christ Lord in your life will transform daily duty into divine delight if we'll get back to loving our Savior the way we ought to. Colossians 3, 1 through 3, at the top of your text there, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. I said a quote earlier. It said, If Christ is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. Are you willing to make him Lord of your life if he's not already the Lord of your life? Surrender completely to Christ without delay. He said this to his disciples. Jesus did in Luke chapter 6. He said, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? He has given us commands. He has showed forth his love to us. And the reasonable thing for us to do is to present our bodies a living sacrifice and to serve him with our life. Father, we love you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for loving us, Lord. And I thank you for the sacrifice you made for us on Calvary, Lord. And thank you for Jesus Christ and the, just what he did for us. But Lord, I also thank you for not only salvation, but Lord, that we can live that exchange life. We were sinners on our way to hell. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ and faith in Jesus Christ, we can be children of God. We can be saved. We can be Christians. And we're so thankful for that. But Lord, I just pray that you'll speak to hearts tonight. I pray that you'll help us to realize that the battle's not over. That there's a time for your people to stand up and to not only just do what's right, but Lord, do it in the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll speak to hearts. I pray that decisions will be made tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. With heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord spoke to your heart. Altars are open. How's your walk with the Lord? Has it become just a duty or is it a delight? so thankful that he delighted in us. Let's do business with the Lord today. For thee, my precious blood, I shed that thou ransom me and quicken from the dead I gave I gave my life for thee what hast thou given for
all God's people said, amen. Thank you, Brother Nick, for the message, the challenge. Uh, it, ought to, it ought to be that everything that we do for the Lord is a delight. It ought to be that way. It ought to be that way. But I know there's times in our life, if we're honest, we feel like it's a duty. And so it was a good reminder tonight, a really good reminder tonight, um, that our service to God ought to be a delight. It ought to be something that's exciting. And so, good, good message tonight, Brother Nick. Thank you for the challenge. Let's go ahead and stay in tonight. And then, Brother Nick, if you and your family want to make your way on back to the back, people come by and thank you for the message. I appreciate you being with us tonight. Uh, just two quick announcements before we dismiss. I asked Brother uh, Greer, if you wouldn't mind making your way up here, Brother Greer, I'm going to have you dismiss this word of prayer. Uh, don't forget, this coming Saturday is church-wide cleaning, and uh, many hands make light work, and so we've got a few things to do on Saturday, and so church family, if you could show up for that. Breakfast will be at 8.30, and then if you're like, I don't want breakfast burrito, hey, we're going to start cleaning about 9 o'clock, and uh, auditorium already got cleaned. So thank you to all those that helped Miss Pam on Tuesday uh, get that taken care of. So that took off a big chunk of cleaning day, but there's still stuff to clean. So if you could be here Saturday morning for that, it'd uh, be a huge, huge blessing. And then lastly, uh, ladies, don't forget, uh, next week, obviously, weekend is our ladies retreat. And uh, just a reminder that the retreat store will not open until Tuesday at 1 p.m. Uh, for you to bring stuff in. If you could help us out with that, uh, please don't bring stuff on Sunday or on Monday. Uh, there are some things we need to move around and shift and get some stuff set up in preparation for that. So ladies, don't forget, a retreat store will open Tuesday at 1 o'clock for you to come in and set up. If you have any questions, please see Ms. Janan Meyer about that. And then as Brother Greer comes, don't forget to pray for Preacher as he finishes up the revival meeting tonight and then preaches the men's conference on Friday and Saturday. Brother Greer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we've had together. Thank you for your word that's gone forth. Help us to be delighted in the, your service. Thank you for the opportunities that we have to show others the light that we have in our uh, joy as we serve you. I pray for Pastor and his uh, own joy as he serves in Colorado, that you would inspire others to want to have what he has. Go with us this evening and the rest of this week and help us to be a blessing to someone else. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.